Good morning, Bright City Church. Welcome to worship. My name is Nat Stein, and I'll be leading us this morning. We're going to have an emphasis on prayer throughout the morning. And so we're going to begin our musical worship with a sung prayer. It's a prayer that actually goes all the way back to the 8th century of Ireland. Most of you were not alive then. But uh, it's a prayer that goes all the way back there. The church has been singing this song for centuries, and it's a, a kind of a 30,000th foot level prayer, thanking God for his guidance and for his wisdom and the fact that he is our all in all and he is the one who provides for us and is our high king of heaven and who loves us more than we could ever imagine. So let's sing together. This is called Be Thou My Vision.
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. These are three very short verses, but very informative, helpful verses to remind us what our will is as we serve the Lord Jesus. It simply says, here's verse 16, rejoice always, two words. Verse 17, two more words, pray constantly. Verse 18 is a little longer. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's continue worshiping now and expressing our gratitude for who God is and what he has done. Let's worship together. Here we go. hands sing and as we lift our hands the heavens open heavens open so let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us and as
tell them You're my honor, my maker My ransom, my savior My refuge, my hiding place You're my helper, my healer My blessed redeemer My answer, my saving grace You're my hope about him, everything we've ever read about him in scripture, or any name that his people have called him throughout history, he is worthy of that. As we call him our blessed redeemer, think about that bridge that we just sang, all those names, our helper, our healer, our blessed redeemer, he's our maker, our creator, our savior, he's our hiding place, everything that we could ever call him, he is worthy of because he's done it. It's not just a hope. Oh, Lord, I hope you can save my soul. I hope you can be my refuge. He is our refuge. He is the lover of our souls. He is the one who redeemed our lives from the grave. And it's an amazing thing that we can thank him for that. So let's thank him right now. Let's pray. God, thank you. Our hearts pour out such gratitude for who you are, what you've done, the fact that we can call on you and call on your name because you are worthy of that. You're worthy to be called our Lord. You are worthy to be called our Savior. And Lord, our hearts cry out more than our lips possibly could. And Lord, our lives we dedicate to you in worship. And Lord, help us to live lives that are worthy of our calling as your children. Thank you for that. And Lord, help us to be so tethered to you that we can't help but reflect your glory and your love everywhere that we go. Lord, you are worthy of your name. Continue to open our eyes and our ears to what you will have for us, your people. We love you. We're grateful for this opportunity to worship you. Well, good morning, Bright City Church. We are so glad to be with you again on another wonderful Sunday morning to worship with you and to just enjoy spending time together as a community. If you are new, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Sharon Miller. This is Ika Miller. We are the pastors here at Bright City Church, and we are so excited that you Absolutely. are joining us yep. this morning. A couple things. First and foremost, we are continuing our worship through our giving. At Bright City, we think of, of giving not just as an interruption in the worship service, but a continuation. It's how we tangibly demonstrate that God is the priority in our lives and that we trust in Him 
first and foremost. And so if you would like to participate in this act of worship, there's a number of easy ways that you can do it. You can text Bright City to 77977, or you can visit our website, brightcitychurch.com slash give. Now, if you are new here, we would really love to connect with you. And there's also a really easy way for us to do that. If you would text Bright City to 94000, that would give us a chance to follow up with you, to get to know you, to hear more about you and what you are looking for as well. And so especially if you have been tuning in for a while still, now yeah. and we still yeah. have not met you yet we yeah. really do want to connect with you <laughs> let us know that you are there we yeah would love to yeah we would, and just yeah. how we can care for you yeah. during this season yeah we love you know zoom is you know i think we're all getting tired of zoom but i would love to get a chance to have a zoom conversation with you and get to know you a little bit uh there will be a tab in the uh, chat that says if you're new here connect with us and please hit that so we can know that you're with mm -hmm. us yeah, so one thing that we have been talking about a lot lately is reopening. As the states reopen, what does that mean for us as a church? And we are taking this very slowly. One of the things we are really fortunate to have is actual experts in our church. We have literally infectious disease experts in our church, public health experts in our church. And so God has really provided for us in that way. We've, yeah. we've got a lot of voices of wisdom speaking into that process. And so we want you to know that that is what is informing how we're thinking through this. And so if it feels slow to know that that is intentional, yeah. that we are taking this very, very seriously. Now, in terms of practically what's happening is our small groups are going to be the front line of our in-person gatherings. So those will be the first groups because they already are connected. They're already gathering weekly. They already qualify for that 10 or less mm -hmm. category. And so we've been in communication with our small group leaders about what it would look like for them to meet outside to meet six feet apart for either watching Sunday morning or for their weekly gatherings. But we are also working on developing locations. If you are not in a small group, we'll have locations mm -hmm. throughout Durham and Raleigh, actually, where if you're not in a small group, but you want to gather with a small group of people on Sunday morning, we are working on that as well. Yeah. But if you have questions, we are doing something that we have never done before that we are very excited about, yeah. which is tonight at 8 p.m., we are doing our first ever church-wide Zoom call. Absolutely. And so excited about just the opportunity to connect with you. I have missed seeing you guys mm -hmm. on Sunday mornings. And so this is kind of a way to make this a two-way conversation again. Yeah, I, I really, I'm very excited about this because anytime I have the opportunity to see people from our church that I haven't seen in two months, it is so exciting. Absolutely. It is so exciting. Amen. And I think that this Zoom call will yep. feel like that times 100. Mm -hmm. And so we want to invite you to join that. If you are new, one way that you can get the link is to actually go to our Instagram, Bright City RDU, And in our link profile, you can find the Zoom link. If you're on our email list, you have gotten that link that mm -hmm. way as well. Yeah. Um, if you're still having trouble, just email us at church at brightcitychurch.com. But Ike will be talking again about yeah. the reopening, but he'll also be opening it for questions for anyone that has questions. We know some of you do have questions. Yeah, we know that during this season where there's so many questions and so much uncertainty, it's so important for us to communicate, communicate, communicate. And so trying to create new ways for that to happen is huge for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the last announcement that we've got, and I'm really excited about this because at the beginning of the year, you know, one of the jokes that's been made so much about 2020 is everybody set up goals and vision for 2020, and this is what 2020 is going to be. And all of a sudden that has all gone down the drain. But the truth is it hasn't. And so uh, one of our leaders, Dorothy Coppett, our children's ministry director, has come to me with this desire of her heart to come around foster families in this season and in general going forward. But knowing that foster families in particular have just struggled and need a support system in place. And that's been her heart. 
And so I'm so excited to share with you guys that she is starting a new small group, a new gathering of people who have hearts in some way to come around foster families. One of the things that she told me is that 30% of families and churches have thought about fostering children, but only about 3% actually do move forward with that decision, which means there's a lot of people that have thought about it, but for whatever reason felt like it wasn't the right decision. And so there's a lot of you I know out there that would love to be a part of helping those families and work, stepping into the foster mm -hmm. system. And so she wants to gather up people who are interested in in some way coming around those foster families, mm -hmm. knowing that that ultimately also supports our vision around the education mm -hmm. and helping those kids take steps forward that will ultimately benefit their long-term future. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested in helping and being a part of that small group, that gathering of people to talk about what that looks like for us as a church, you can email email Dorothy at kidscity at brightcitychurch.com and she would love to help you take that next step into that small group but really excited about us mm -hmm. continuing to fulfill our vision as a church regardless of pandemic. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right well this morning we are continuing our series Flourishing Under Quarantine uh, Practical Steps for Growing Your Faith and we are looking in this particular season of our lives uh, uh, what are the practices, what are the habits that we can put into place in our lives so that we can flourish in such a unique and challenging situation? And my hope is that once we come out of this season, that the practices and the habits that we put in place in our life during this time will continue beyond this. And so this morning we're looking at another practice that I think is important for us to bring into our lives and to make a consistent part of our lives and we're going to be looking at it through the lens of a passage from Matthew chapter 26. Now, this may not be a passage that you would have expected to dive into, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But we are going to be in Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to be looking at the practice of prayer. Now, the reason that the practice of prayer matters so much is because I think we see that this is one of the most universal practices among religious and spiritual people, regardless of what you embrace, regardless of what you claim about your faith, uh, prayer is essential to all of it. And I think for us, especially as followers of Jesus, as we read the scriptures, uh, a lot of times we tend to think of prayer as something that I do in terms of what I have to say to God. But I think prayer is so much more than that. And what I want to do this morning is help you open your eyes to seeing how much more prayer can be. I think prayer is at the heart of what we see when authors in Scripture write things like, taste and see that the Lord is good in Psalm 34. That, th that prayer is how we taste and see that the Lord is good. In John 7, Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Well, the way that we come to him and drink is through prayer. That's how we have our thirst satisfied as we come to him in prayer. In the psalm, it says, be still and know that I am God. That's how we do that is through prayer. We, we still ourselves, we silence ourselves to know that he is God. Another verse uh, from Psalm 46, as well as Isaiah 30 says, Cease striving and know that I am God. In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust in your strength. I just love the way that it, that it takes the pressure off of us of saying the right things, of doing the right things, of doing this the right way, and just resting, of being in silence and knowing that he is God. And that will be the way that our soul is fed and filled. And so prayer, in my mind, prayer is drinking from the well of God. Now, one of the things that I think is true for a lot of us when it comes to prayer is we feel this need to understand it before we can do it, right? Like if I, it, I, I just can't bring myself to pray because I don't really understand it. And the truth is, if we're being honest with ourselves, and I want you to be honest with yourself in this moment, there's things that we do every single day that we're not quite sure how it works or why it works or what the mechanism of it is exactly that makes it work, but that doesn't keep us from doing it. It can be as simple as something like turning on the light switch. When I wake up in the morning, I turn on the light switch. I'm not thinking, okay, I'm doing this because I fully understand exactly why me hitting this switch leads to that light coming on over my head. For some of us, it does. We're electrical engineers. We get all of that. 
For others of us, every single day, we get in our car, we push the button on our car, we turn that switch and it cranks the engine. And we're not quite sure why it does that, but that doesn't keep us from doing it, right? Or maybe it's, you know, the fact that we travel on airplanes all the time. I don't know how many of us can really say, hey, here is why this works. Here's how this works. But that doesn't keep us from getting on that airplane and flying every day. And I think the same thing is true with prayer. We may not always understand why it works or how it works or all the inner dynamics of it, but I want to encourage you to not let that keep you from entering time of prayer with God. And so we're looking at a passage today of prayer in Scripture, a story of prayer in Scripture that I think is pretty powerful because it's not just anybody praying. It's not just any normal human being praying. We are looking at a prayer that Jesus himself prays. And what I love about this is that it actually speaks to a lot of the reasons why you and I have trouble praying. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read our whole passage together, and then we're going to go back through this. And I'm going to speak to some of the things that I think is so challenging for us when it comes to prayer. Matthew uh, chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. It says, Then Jesus came to them, came with them to a place called Gethsemane. So this is after Jesus has had uh, the Last Supper with his disciples. He knows that Peter's going to deny him. He's called him out on that. And they go out to this place called Gethsemane. It says, And he told them, he told the disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell down and prayed. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Come on, disciples. He asked Peter, so couldn't you stay awake with me one hour, just one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Now, I don't know how many of you have thought about this and thought about this being a prayer that Jesus offers, but there's four reasons why I wanted to pick this passage for us to dive into when it comes to prayer. First of all, just the fact that Jesus prayed a prayer that we can then look at and see that Jesus struggled with some of the same things that we struggled with, that you and I struggled with when it came to prayer. And I want to list those out for you now. The first one, and I think the most common reason you and I have trouble praying, is because we have had prayers that went unanswered. And when we thought, man, you know what? My prayer went unanswered. What's the point of continuing to pray? Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus had a prayer that went unanswered. Jesus' prayer in this moment was that this cup would pass from him, that we, he wouldn't have to go through this. Yes, Jesus goes on to pray, but no, but your will be done. But at the heart of it, his prayer was, let this cup pass from me. Don't, don't let me have to go through this. We all pray the prayer, right? Of, but let your will be done. But still at the heart of our prayer, there's something we really, really want. And we see that with Jesus here. And yet his prayer, we ultimately know, goes unanswered. He still has to drink this cup. He still has to go through this. The second thing, and this is what we see with the disciples in this, is that the disciples are invited to pray. They are called upon Jesus to pray, and yet they can't help themselves but fall asleep. And I think what we see with the disciples is this question of like, why can't I focus? 
Like if God wants me to pray, why can't I focus? Why can't I focus on praying? If this is something God wants me to do, why isn't he giving me the strength to do it? I think we've all asked that question at some point. A third thing that I think is a challenge for many of us when it comes to prayer is this question of if God's will is going to be done anyway, why pray in the first place? Right? If Jesus says, you know what, if this cup, if I have to drink this cup, let your will be done. Well, what's the point of praying in the first place? Why would I pray if it doesn't matter, if it's not going to change God's will? And then the fourth thing that we see, and I think we all wrestle with this one as well, and it's a challenge for us when it comes to prayer, is that if God is loving and all-powerful, why doesn't he fix my circumstances? If God has the power to change this situation, and if he loves me enough, why doesn't he change my circumstances? Why do I pour my heart out in prayer? Why don't I pour my heart out to the point of sorrow and death, and yet he doesn't change my situation? I want us to look at those today as we walk through this passage and get at some of these answers and some of these questions about why you and I, myself included, wrestling with prayer and why we can still lean into prayer as a practice that helps grow our faith. So we're going to start back at verse 36. And it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus is looking into the end of his life at this point. He knows the crucifixion is coming just a few verses away. And he told them, he told the disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Man, how many of us have come to God in prayer, troubled and sorrowful, right? Like that seems like it. Sometimes that's the only thing that will bring us to prayer is that we're so full of sorrow and we're so troubled. We have nowhere else to go. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Verse 39, going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup Pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. A little bit of what I want us to do today is I want us to look at some misconceptions around prayer, around what we've thought prayer was about, and maybe to nuance that a little bit, maybe to uh, speak to ways that prayer is intended to be practiced in ways that it's different than we expected, or maybe. Uh, some purposes behind prayer that are different than what we expected. And so in this first one, what we see is that Jesus is praying to change God's plan. Jesus is praying, God, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. He's, he's praying to change God's plan. But what I want you to know, first of all, is that praying is not only us changing God's plans, but it's God changing our plans. That one of the things that happens as we pray is that God changes our plans. He speaks into how we are seeing the world and changes our plans as our lives and our desires are brought into conformity with His. Prayer has this power to connect us to the bigger story of God. Prayer disconnects us from our smaller individual stories, and not that our stories are insignificant, but sometimes we can get so wrapped up in the story of our own lives happening right in front of us that we can't see the bigger picture of what God is doing in the world. And sometimes we need that in order for our plans to be changed. A few months ago, we went to Disney World right before this whole coronavirus thing hit. We got in right under the, the window, so to speak, and we were there, and it was our first time being there since the Pandora World opened. And so me and a couple of uh, our family members were going to go on the new Flight of Passage ride, right? This ride where, uh, like the movie Pandora, you get to go on these animals that uh, fly, dragon-like bird animals, and you get in on them, and the point is you hook into them. You hook your kind of cable into their cable, so to speak, for lack of a better term, and through that, you're able to control the, what they do, their movements and how they 
move. And so we had sat through this line for about three hours and I was miserable and I was like, is this even worth it? What's the point of us waiting three hours in this line? And then you get on this ride and they begin to simulate you hooking in with this creature that flies throughout the Pandora world, taking crazy turns up and down and all over the place. And it's this beautiful 3D. I mean, it's incredible. But what it does is by hooking in with this creature as the Navi did, you get to enter into a whole different world that is so much bigger than we could have imagined standing in line, waiting three hours to get on this ride. And a little bit of what prayer does is it helps us to connect into the bigger world of what God is doing, the bigger story of what God is doing in the world so that we can see the bigger picture, that we can see beyond our own individual story to see what God is doing in the world. And sometimes that changes our plans. When we're able to see what God is up to, it changes how we pray. It changes how we focus on what we're doing with our daily lives. And so the first part of this is that prayer is not just about us changing God's plan, but it's about God changing our plans. We go on to verse 40 through 41. It says, Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. Come on, guys. He answered Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me for one hour? Just stay awake and pray. And he says, stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. And then he says this word that I think all of us can identify with, this phrase. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So many of us, right, like our spirit desires to pray. Like we desire to spend time in prayer. And yet, man, our bodies are just like, I'm so tired. I can't do it. I can't keep going. I don't have the mental capacity. I don't have the the physical ability to focus. And so the second thing that I want you to know about prayer is that prayer is not only doing what God wants, but it's doing what's best for us. Flesh, this word flesh here is, uh, in this sense, is, is antithetical to what God's Spirit wants to do in us. Now, the word flesh we see used all kinds of ways in Scripture. Sometimes it's very neutral. It just refers to the physical body. But in other contexts, it refers to kind of the pushback that our lives give to God's Spirit working in our lives. And that seems to be what Jesus is speaking to here is is the way that our, our flesh, our natural sinful desire, pushes back against what God's Spirit wants to do in our lives. And there's a couple things that I want to say on this. First of all, one of the things that was told to me early on and has been so liberating for me, and I hope it's liberating for you too, is the fact that, you know what? What better way to fall asleep than to fall asleep in God's presence? I mean, if prayer is us being in God's presence, what better way to fall asleep, to go into a peaceful rest than by doing that in God's presence. And so I want you to know, if you have trouble staying awake while you pray, you tend to fall asleep while you pray, don't beat yourself up about that. Don't get frustrated with yourself about that. Just embrace that as as the peace of God coming over your life and giving you rest, because Lord knows so many of us having trouble finding rest these days. But the other thing that I want you to know is that some of this might have to do with the priority that we place on prayer in our lives. That so many of us wait to pray until it's the worst time of day for us to pray, right? We put it at the end of our day, you know, when we're exhausted, we can't focus, we can't think. What does it look like for us to put prayer at a better part of our day, where we're more energized, we have more focus, we're able to really put our attention on God. And so maybe it's a matter of priority. How are you prioritizing prayer in your day so that the Spirit of God that's in you is stronger than the exhaustion of the flesh, of our tired human bodies that work against our ability to focus on God. And so knowing that sometimes our fleshly bodies work against what's best for us, the best thing for us is to enter into God's presence through prayer And yet sometimes our physical bodies work against us. And so how do we combat that? We combat that by putting this time of prayer in our life in the best times of our day. 
Verse 42 through 43, it says again, a second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. All right, so the disciples have fallen asleep again. Jesus has come back to them. And, but we know that Jesus continues to pray this prayer. And we said that the third kind of challenge or obstacle to us praying oftentimes is, if God's will is going to be done anyway, why pray in the first place? Why would I pray in the first place if God's will is going to be done? And Jesus says those words here. He says, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Why is Jesus praying? What is the point of Jesus praying? Which leads to the third thing that I want you to understand, the third kind of shift to understand about prayer is that, yes, prayer is about us changing what God wants or what God wills, but it's also about God changing what we want. It's about God changing our hearts. It's about God changing our desires. The point here is to have our desires conformed to His. Now, I'm going to nerd out for a second. I'm sorry. I know that that's not exciting for everyone, but I know I've got some some theology loving nerds out there so i want you to 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 really lean in in this moment i want to talk about god's will and how that plays into this conversation around prayer now there's lots of ways of breaking this down but i want to break god's will down into three kind of wills the first will of god is the decreative will of god and the decreative will of god are the things that god has willed for his creation for all time things like the establishment of his kingdom, the second coming of Christ, the defeat of the evil one, and the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. God has decreed for all time that those things are going to happen, and there's nothing that we can do to change that. A second part of God's will is what we would call the moral will. The moral will is what God desires us to do from a moral and ethical standpoint, the things that God commands of us or invites us to do because it's the best thing for our lives. But we have the choice to disobey that. We have the freedom to disobey God's moral will. And then finally, there is what we call the permissive will. What The, the things that God allows to happen, yeah, they're not what God desires to happen. They're not in line with God's perfect intentions for his creation. But in given humanity free will and in the brokenness, brokenness of our creation, God allows those things to happen. And so I think it's important for us when it comes to prayer to know that it's not just what we pray that's at work in this, but it's our own desires. It's our own willingness to adhere to God's moral will, or it's our own desires to commit to see God's decreative will at work in our lives, to be a part of that, to get to participate in what God is doing. Yes, God's going to accomplish it, whether we choose to be a part of it or not. But a part of prayer is us conforming our lives to be a part of what God decrees will happen in his creation. And so I want to invite you to understand that prayer isn't just about us changing what God wants and God wills, but about changing what we want and we will to match God's will. The fourth thing, the fourth obstacle for many of us is this question of if God is loving and all-powerful, and this may be the most important one for many of us, the most challenging, the most difficult one for all of us, is if God is loving and all-powerful, why doesn't he change my circumstances? Why doesn't he answer my prayer? Why have I been praying for this person my entire life, praying for their healing, praying for their recovery, praying for things to get so much better? I've been praying for so long, and yet God hasn't answered my prayer. He doesn't answer my prayer. If, but if he's loving and powerful, why not? And you've got to know in this moment where Jesus is facing the end of his life, he's facing his death, he's got to be on some way being human to some degree, has to be asking that question. God, why aren't you changing this? If you love me and you're all powerful, why aren't you changing this. And yet these are the words that we hear Jesus say. It says, after leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once again. Again, praying, God, take this away, but if it is your will, let it be done. 
Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. In other words, by this time, in this moment, Jesus has resolved himself that this is what God desires. This is God's decreative will. This is what is intended for the healing of his creation is that he go and be betrayed into the hands of of sinners that he would die on the cross. And so what we see is that prayer is not just about inviting God into our story, but it's about us being invited into the bigger story of all humanity. That's what Jesus understood was happening here. Yes, God, Jesus wanted God to intervene into his story to change the outcome of this, to change where this was all headed. But, but Jesus knew that this was about more than his own individual story. Jesus knew that this was about the redemption of all humanity. This was a much bigger story than just Jesus' individual life. And so the model of Jesus that we see is, is not that he couldn't fix Jesus' circumstances out of love, it's not that he couldn't fix Jesus' circumstances out of his power, but how does he not interrupt the narrative of how God wanted to heal the world? That for God to step in and to answer Jesus' prayer in this moment, to use his love and his power to fix it, it would have interrupted God's narrative of healing all creation for Jesus, for you, for me, for all of creation. And so what we're being invited to do, as hard as it is, as challenging as it is, is to see the ways that we, through our suffering, through our pain, are being invited into the bigger story of God's healing, even when we can't always see what that means. Even when the answer to that goes beyond our entire lives. That's the power of this story, is that the outcome of this did not reside in Jesus' own life. It resided on the other side of his death. And there's prayers that we pray that don't get answered, and we'll never see the outcome of why that had to happen, why it went the way it did, why it had to go the way that it went. Jesus knew that in order not to upend the redemption of the world, that this was going to have to come at the cost of his life. I don't know what it is that you have been praying for, what it is that you have been coming before God over and over and over again, and you're getting exhausted and you're entering into uh, cynicism about this. You know, well, I, if I know what's going to happen, if I know God's not going to answer it anyway, what's the point of me praying? Maybe there's just a despair about it, about prayer. Like, what's the point if it's not going to change anything? And yet, it may ultimately change something. It's going to take a while. But even if it doesn't, what's the bigger story that we're being invited into? I know that some of us are hardened by the things that we've seen, the things that have made it difficult for us to come before God in prayer because we just see time and time again what feels like prayers unanswered. I get that. I understand how hard that is. And so what I want you to hear from me, what I want you to understand from this passage and from this message is that prayer is not just about us talking to God and making known to God, hey, here's what I want to see. But prayer is also about hearing from God. It's about hearing from God. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in saying the right things to God or saying them in enough times or saying them persistently enough. And God is saying to you, look, stop talking. What I want is just for you to come and to hear from me. To come and to be in my presence. To come and to experience my peace. That the answer may not come that you want, but what trans transcends our answers and our need for answers is his presence. 
And so I want to invite you not to focus on what are the right things to say, but what God is saying to you in the present circumstances. The best moments of prayer for me have been the moments of, honestly, of silence. The moments where I just finally got time apart by myself. And this is why I get up before everybody else in my house gets up, is just so I have some time in silence. Not so that I have time to, to pray everything that I want to pray and feel like I should pray, but just so that I can silently sit with God. Silently sit in God's presence and listen to what He wants to say to me. And maybe that's the shift that you need to make for a little while when it comes to prayer. This doesn't have to be always, but maybe you choose for a little while, you know what? I'm going to go to prayer not within a list of things, not with an agenda, but simply so that I can experience peace that comes through intimacy with God. Peace that comes through sitting silently in God's presence. You know, there was a desert father, and the desert fathers were this group of early monks uh, around 400 AD who felt this call to go out into the desert because going out into the desert really showed that they had set themselves apart from Christ. And there's the story of this one monk who walked around with rocks in his mouth for I don't know how long. I don't know if it was weeks, months, but through having these rocks in his mouth, he learned the power of silence. That in some order for us sometimes to hear God, we have to be quiet long enough for God's voice to speak. To quiet not only our mouths, but our minds and our hearts, so that in those moments we can hear the voice of God speaking in our lives. One of my favorite theologians uh, by the name of Karl Barth wrote this. He says, we pray not because we must, but because we may. And I think we need to recover this sense that prayer isn't something we have to do. It's not an obligation. It's not something that's forced upon us, but it is a gift. It becomes a must because it becomes something that people insist that we do, right? And I think a lot of us, because of the things that we've experienced and things we've seen, our soul has been, it's been harmed, right? We've experienced scar tissue. These things have built up around our soul that keep us from experiencing God's presence. Uh, a couple of nights ago, our family uh, was craving some Mexican food. And so we decided to go out to Moe's, which, no offense, I feel is far inferior to Chipotle. Chipotle is my go-to. Uh, but Moe's was closer, so we got some Moe's, picked up some queso. And queso is delicious, but if you know anything about queso, you know that when it gets hard, it's hard to get it off of a plate. And so we had... Uh, eating dinner, you know, we had queso on these plates, and it was hard to get that queso off. We were scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing. Some of us think prayer is like scrubbing on God. Like if I just scrub hard enough, I'll get what I want out of this. But instead, the only way to really get that queso off of that plate is to just let it soak. To just let it soak. And for some of us, we need to step away from this notion of prayer as just like scrubbing on God until God give me what I want. And it means that we just let ourselves soak in God. To soak in the living water of God. To soak up God and let him soften the things that have built up around our heart that keep us from experiencing him. That keep us from being sensitive to what he wants to speak into our lives. And so what I want you to hear this morning, what I want you to walk away with, what I don't want you to forget, is that prayer, prayer is not about saying the right things to God, but prayer, the point of prayer, is the person and presence of God. That through prayer we experience the person and presence of God in our lives. I think sometimes we get so caught up in the outcomes of our prayers. Like if I pray this, this will give me that. And when that doesn't happen, we get frustrated, we become skeptical, we become uh, cynical about prayer. It's not going to happen anyway, so why do I even pray? But prayer isn't just about the outcomes, it's about the incomes. 
what I mean by that is a lot of times when we think of income, we think of money. We think of money that comes into our house because of the work that we do. But income originally comes from a word that has to do with entrance, arrival. And so I want you to begin to think about prayer as, as the income from God. What's coming into us through our time with Him? What's coming into our lives and into our hearts? What is arriving in our lives because of our, our time that we set apart to be in God's presence? What is the income that comes when we change the way that we think about prayer? I want to end our time with just a moment of honesty. I want to invite you to a time of prayer to ask, you know, where are you with prayer? Where are you with prayer this morning? And I want to invite you to close your eyes and just to reflect on that question for a moment of where are you with prayer? Are you focused on the outcomes or are you focused on the incomes of prayer? Are you focused on saying the right things to God or hearing the right things from God? Are you focused on changing God's plans or allowing God to change your plans? Are you focused on changing God's will or allowing Him to change your will? I want to take your moment to just pray to God. Create some space for you to just pray to God and say, God, this is where I'm at. Help me take a step into deeper intimacy in my prayer life with you. God, I realize that we are all over the place in our prayer lives. Some of us, our lives of prayer and intimacy with you are deep and life-giving and flourishing. And others of us, there's this weariness about us, maybe even this cynicism about prayer. And what's the point of praying? God, I pray that we would just seek to take that next step. If it's just simply saying, okay, God, change my heart towards prayer. Help me to see why it matters that I pray. I invite you to pray that. For others of you, that maybe there's a consistency, but it's starting to feel routine and rote. I invite you to pray, God, breathe life into my prayer life. Meet me again in fresh and new ways in my prayer life. Others of you, we thank God that there is just an intimacy and a fire to your life with God and to your prayer time, that you understand that, yeah, there's things that are bigger than our individual story, and yet you're able to walk into that and willing to walk into that and embrace whatever that means for God's big story of healing and redemption in the world. For wherever you're at, I invite you to pray this prayer with me, this, this prayer that the church has been praying since Jesus taught us to pray it, which is this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, one of the things that I love about this prayer of Jesus, this time where Jesus goes to God in desperation of prayer, is that it's taken place right after this meal that Jesus has had with his disciples, where he has proclaimed the future of the church through this meal of taking the bread and the cup with his disciples. And yet he still is in agony. He still desires for this cup to be removed 
from him. And so what we're reminded is, is even in Jesus and even in his strength, there was agony. There was despair. And so as a church, we take this meal, we take this bread and this cup as a way of reminding us that, yeah, God in Jesus still wrestled with what was ahead of him, but he knew it had to be done. It was resolve. It was declaring the future before it had happened, declaring the future in, 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 in the face of the obstacles in front of him. And so as we do every week, we're going to end our time by taking this meal together. So I invite you, if you're alone, to take your cup, if you're with family or if you're with friends, to take that bread that you've got. Maybe it's a cracker, a chip, whatever you've got. And I want you to place yourself at that table with Jesus, where Jesus sits with his disciples. And he says, this is my body broken for you, proclaiming that his own body was going to be broken for us as his people. And so for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, we take this bread and we break it, remembering Jesus' words, this is my body broken for you. And so I say these words to you, and I invite you to say this to those around you, but to know this is Christ's body broken for you. And then Jesus took the cup, the cup that he had there at the table with him as he met with his disciples, knowing what was ahead, the agony that was ahead, but with the resolve to step into that, knowing what God's will was, regardless of what his desires were, what his prayer was, what his plans were. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. And so we take this knowing that this is the blood that Christ shed for you and for me. And so I invite you to take this now hearing these words, this is Christ's blood shed for you and for me. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of prayer, that it's not something we have to do, but it's something that we get to do. And so, God, I invite our whole community to change the way we think about prayer. Not as something that we do because we can say the right words to you, but because it's a space and a time that you intentionally created for us to come and to hear from you. And this prayer, all that we know is Jesus prayed one sentence. Lord, take this cup from me, but if not, let your will be done. And yet he prayed for hours what that tells us is that prayer isn't primarily about what we say to you, but about what you are doing in us in that time. So God, set us free from the pressure that we feel to pray certain words or just to pray in a certain way, but to just find that time as a space to connect with you, to be intimate with you, to experience your peace come over us, and that out of that intimacy and out of that peace, we would be driven out into the world to accomplish your mission, to place ourselves in your greater story for the world of healing and what we know is ultimately resurrection. That was the beauty of Jesus' story is that he knew it was headed towards resurrection, that the outcome of his death was going to be new life for all of us. And so may we, God, as your people, see the suffering in our lives and say, ultimately, I know that this is headed towards resurrection, the new life that you have for all of us that know we can't see it now, know we may not see it in our lifetime, know we may not see it in the lifetimes to follow, but ultimately, God, this is intended towards your glorious plan of restoration and healing and resurrection. And may we live into that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join in this last song again, affirming his worthiness. He's worthy of every song, every praise, every prayer. Let's lift it up. Here we go. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live 
for you Sing Jesus Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one that could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
just like we started our service with a prayer that was many, many, many centuries old, we're going to finish our service with a prayer from the 5th century. Yes, the 5th century. This is commonly known as the breastplate of St. Patrick. St. Patrick, of course, was a saint in Ireland in the 5th century. And this prayer is attributed to him. It's actually a, a portion of one of his prayers. But it's very simple, very straightforward, and it goes like this. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. May that be our prayer and your prayer as you go about your week this week. May Christ 